Where the piney woods of East Texas meet the boggy bayous of Louisiana, reports of a hairy, man-like creature have long circulated in the shadows of the scenic Caddo Lake. As one of the largest flooded forests in the United States, Caddo conjures images of a primordial past with its towering cypress trees draped in Spanish moss. The landscape here is a home to a variety of wildlife, including majestic waterfowl, eagles, snakes, alligators, and wild boar. Could it also be home to something far more mysterious? I'm Ken Gerhard, and I'm Lyle Blackburn. We've always been fascinated by the possibility of unknown creatures living in our mists. In addition to writing books on the subject, we've spent years touring as musicians. Now we're combining both into the ultimate road trip in search of strange beasts and monstrous legends. This is the American Monster Tour. And this creature came out of the woods and we almost hit it with a car. When I looked up, you know, that's when I saw it step out. You know, one of my favorite places to go is Caddo Lake. Not only is it scenically beautiful with the lake and the bayous, but there's a history of Bigfoot encounters. Oh yeah, that must be true because I've heard that the Caddo Indian tribe, which is local to that area, they have legends of lost giants, which are essentially uh, huge hairy savages that live deep in the swamp. Absolutely. If you say these things do exist, and certainly the Native Americans of the time would have had encounters with them. So what about, uh, you know, the history of sightings in that area? I mean, how far back do they go? The sightings go back to the early 1900s, and many of these were documented in the newspaper. One of the most famous sightings dates back to 1965. During the summer of that year, 13-year-old Johnny Maples was walking on a rural road in Marion County when he heard a noise in the bushes. Thinking it was a friend playing a joke, he called out. When he didn't get a response, he threw a rock into the bushes. The next thing you know, a tall, ape-like creature covered in long black hair came out of the bushes. Well, of course, the boy was frightened and he started running down the road. The creature jumped over a fence and started after him, but it only had to walk to keep up with Johnny as he ran. As he ran, he looked back periodically to see if the thing was still behind him, and finally he looked back and it was gone. When he got home, he was in such shock, he told his mother. She called the Marion County Sheriff's Office and told them what had happened. They actually organized a monster hunt, but nothing was ever found. A short time later, a couple was walking in the old foundry cemetery when they heard a blood-chilling scream come out of the woods. The next day, they found a set of large, unidentified tracks outside the cemetery gates leading towards the woods into a creek. Once the stories made the newspapers, this brought forth yet another witness who claimed he had seen something in the area much earlier. In 1927, Richard Eason said he was working as a railway conductor when they stopped in the woods of Marion County. He was getting out to make a communication call at an old telephone house, and this was at night. He said that he got out, and by the flickering light of the engine's firebox, he could see what he described as a huge ape-like or gorilla-like creature standing on two legs. Whoa. Well, he, he was so frightened, he ran back, obviously, into the engine, and he told the crew what he had seen, but none of them wanted to go out and find the creature. Well, obviously. <laughs> so, I mean, sightings like these, a man-like creature in the area, have continued into the present day. Well, it definitely sounds like there's a long, rich history of sightings in that area. What I'm curious about is, do we have anything recent, any recent eyewitnesses? Yeah, there's actually been uh, continued sightings that have gone on, and there's some that have been very recent. I know some of the witnesses, in fact. If we go out there, we could probably call them up and interview them. Well, that would be outstanding. 
I mean, as much as I love hearing those old Bigfoot stories, I mean, there's nothing like interviewing a witness face to face and getting that firsthand account. Absolutely, that's the best part about this. And the best part about being on the road is we can go to the place, we can interview the witnesses, and we can have a look around. Let's do it. We decided to start our investigation by heading to the small town of Jefferson, Texas. Jefferson is located in the far eastern portion of the state, only a few miles from Caddo Lake and the border of Louisiana. Not only is Jefferson said to be the most haunted small town in America, it has proclaimed itself to be the Bigfoot capital of Texas. Yeah, the Jefferson General Store is a place I always come to. It's kind of a throwback to a 1950s soda shop. It's really amazing. I feel like I'm going back in time. <laughs> yeah. They even got a few Bigfoot things for sale here. Yeah, check this out. Wow. People come in here all the time, um, and they say they've seen Bigfoot in Jefferson, Caddo Lake, all around the area. Are you from this area? Have you ever experienced anything yourself? I am. I'm from here. Um, we live closer to the lake, and sometimes we will smell a weird smell and see tracks, and we remember that's kind of what he puts out. And so we're like, mm, maybe it's Bigfoot. It's scary. I don't know. As we spoke to employees at the general store, we were approached by a hunter who told us of an experience he had had on Caddo Lake several years ago. This was pure luck. If he hadn't been in the store that day, we would have never known about this incident. Year 2000, 99, 2000, I was fishing and it got, it was just getting dark, just getting dusky dark and heard something in the woods and looked out and saw something walking through the woods. Big, it was eight, eight foot tall problem. Wow. It's not a bear. Yeah. You know, I've seen bears before. I know what a bear looks like. I knew it wasn't a bear. How did you feel when you saw that thing? Are you pretty scared or you just kind of not freaked really. out? Or? I mean, I was surprised. Yeah. You know, never in your, in your wildest dreams sure. you're going to see something like that. And so, you know, I was surprised. It was, what is that? And then, uh, I feel like the, earlier this year in the same exact spot, heard heard something whoop and whoop once. A few minutes later, done it again from the exact same spot, the same general spot. And I mean, that kind of scared me more than seeing something. Great meeting here today. Fantastic, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just, weird seeing y'all here. <laughs> Be safe out there, buddy. Weirder Love things. <laughs> While in town, we arranged to meet with Craig Woolheater, who founded the Texas Bigfoot Research Center in 1999. Woolheater has not only amassed an incredible amount of Southern Bigfoot reports over the years, he is also the organizer of the Texas Bigfoot Conference held each year in Jefferson. So thanks for meeting us, this is awesome. It's always fun to come to Jefferson and hang out. It's always great to hang out with two of my, my best buds here, you know, talk Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. What's better than that? That's right, that's what we're out here doing, talking cryptids, Bigfoot, Caddo creature. It's as good as it gets. <laughs> but, yeah, you couldn't ask for a better place. I mean, there's, you know, within a stone's throw here, you know, you get a, a dozen sightings that I can think of off the top of my head of people that said they've seen, you know, Bigfoot or a swamp monster or whatever out here in this area. I mean, going, going way back. You know, most people, when they think of Bigfoot, obviously they think of the Pacific Northwest, you know, California, Washington. Some people might think of Florida, the Skunk Ape, but people don't, traditionally I don't think of Texas, but doesn't Texas rank pretty high in terms of the number of Bigfoot sightings nationwide? I think, um, you know, on, on the large uh, national database of Bigfoot sightings out there, that Texas, I think, is fifth, ranked fifth. Um, you know, there's Washington, Oregon, California, here in the United States, Ohio and Pennsylvania are pretty high, and Texas is right up there as well. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and right here on the outskirts of Jefferson, we have Caddo Lake, and that's where a lot of the sightings have taken place. Uh, and, you know, Caddo Lake spans into Louisiana. I know that 
you had a sighting nearby in Louisiana that kind of sparked your whole interest in the Bigfoot phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I was interested as a kid, but you know, you grow up and, you know, life and families and jobs take over. But in 1994, uh, I was driving back from Memorial Day weekend with friends and family that we had gone down to New Orleans and um, came back and on the way back, on this unlit two lane road out in the middle of nowhere, saw a large, um, you know, hair covered figure off to the right of the road as we're driving in the headlights. And, um, you know, just changed my reality at that point. And so I really got interested in the subject and started uh, networking with people across the country and then decided to host the conference here in Jefferson. Um, you know, it's there's a long history here um, in this area. Um, we started getting sighting reports and talking to people, doing investigations, um, started looking at historical accounts. While most people associate Bigfoot or Sasquatch with the Pacific Northwest, there are a surprising number of reports stemming from the eastern United States and particularly the boggy bottomlands of the Deep South. In Florida swamps, they are called the skunk ape due to their pungent stench. In states like Alabama and Mississippi, they are often referred to as wild men or woolly boogers. Louisiana has the Honey Island Swamp Monster and Arkansas the Falk Monster. The descriptions are similar to those of Bigfoot, except the southern versions seem to be slightly shorter and display a generally nasty and aggressive attitude. Due to their muddy habitat, their shaggy fur is often said to be dirty and unkempt, and there are even claims of them possessing only three to four toes rather than the five digits displayed by the traditional Bigfoot. Craig, thank you for everything you've done to shine a spotlight on the Bigfoot phenomenon in hey, Texas. thanks guys, man. Great to hang out. After meeting with Craig, we decided to locate the old Foundry Cemetery north of Jefferson where some of the 1965 incidents had occurred. Visiting the location, even so many years later, would give us some insight into the older reports. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of woods between here and Jefferson, and it still looks pretty wooded. A lot of this has been clear cut, but, you know, it's still pretty much out in the woods. A lot of old growth. I mean, this is a pretty overgrown, pretty dense area. I mean, it's, you could definitely see the potential here for a large, elusive animal to be running around. Yeah, it makes total sense that this would be where they'd find a mysterious track where there'd be some sightings and this caused the whole uproar in the newspaper early on and spurred the whole monster hunt. There'd be a lot of accounts of Bigfoot creatures around cemeteries. Do you find that in your research as well? Why, why would you think that is? Yeah, I don't know, but other than the fact that a lot of these old cemeteries are out in the woods. You know, they're in rural places and that's kind of the place where people are going to uh, look for paranormal activity and suddenly they find a Bigfoot track. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm also noticing the, you know, the sound of the train nearby. You mentioned that old account of the... Yeah, I thought of that. When I heard that train, I thought, wow, this is not far from where the railroad conductor had the sighting in 1927. You know, and this is just north of Jefferson in a heavily wooded area. It totally makes sense. Don't you have some folks we can talk to that maybe have seen or experienced something? Yeah, I've got a few witnesses. We can call them up and uh, hear their stories. The following day, we met with Dick Tinsley, an eyewitness who saw a large ape-like creature near Caddo Lake in the 1970s. Tinsley's encounter has become one of the best on record. Yeah, well, Lyle tells me you've had a remarkable encounter. I did. Uh, it was about 1978, almost 40 years ago, around a Cross Lake area, mm -hmm. the Caddo Lake area, uh, northern Louisiana and probably 1.30 in the morning, two o'clock, something like that. And I had dimmed my headlights and I had slowed down because the other car I was meeting it was just all over the road. I didn't know what he was gonna do. And so he finally got past me and I had slowed down to 10 or 15 miles an hour. And when I put my headlights on high beam again, I seen a set of eyes in the opposing ditch. And at that point in time, the ditch was four or five foot deep. And the eyes was 
three or four foot above it. Wow. Yeah. And 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 I'm thinking, I said, well, whatever it is, it's either on the other side of the ditch or whatever. And well, by this time, I had just about stopped, and it come out of the ditch, seven foot plus, eight maybe, reddish brown hair, long hair, hairy body, very muscular, extremely muscular body, had a very long gait, long arm swing. I could see its profile. It never looked at me, but it knew I was there. Distance to it was 20 feet, maybe. Mm -hmm. If it was, I mean, I got a good look at it. And I'm sitting there in my truck and I'm thinking, <laughs> nobody's going to believe this when I tell them. And I pulled up there and I turned my truck sideways in the road to see if I could see it and nothing. It's just like it vanished in thin air. Now, did it go this way, that way? I can't tell you, but it was the hair on its head. It was kind of flowing hair mm -hmm. and I could see its profile and it had hair up to about his cheekbones or whatever, but it had a very profound nose, the eyes, and that was 40 years ago almost. And it was years after that. I mean, I'm okay, you know, but it was years after that, that it was after daylight before I'd go anywhere. And it's a sighting that that it just burns itself into your brain. I mean, it's just fact. It exists, I believe in it, and it's real. What is it? I, I can't stand here and tell you, I don't know. But I seen what I seen that night. It's real. Whatever it is that you want to call it, it's real. Another thing about Cattle Lake, it was the setting for some of my favorite movies. Oh, you must be talking about The Creature from Black Lake, which is a cult film from the 70s. Probably one of the best Bigfoot movies ever made, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of my favorite Bigfoot movies. It was made in 1976 and filmed in and around Cattle Lake on the eastern side and also at Oil City, Louisiana. Cattle Lakes, you know, with the kind of the moss and the, the scenery that primordial swamp scenery, you know, that's just something that makes the movie great unto itself. The Creature from Black Lake is coming to a theater near you. A Jim McCullough production, rated PG. Our next stop was the Claiborne House Bed and Breakfast located in the heart of Jefferson's historic district. There, we met Charles Faison, another eyewitness who saw something entirely unexplainable while camping with his brother deep in the Caddo Bayous. Hey, gentlemen. How are you? Charles? Good, good. How are y'all? to meet you, sir. Pleasure to see y'all. So for me, yours has always been one of the best encounters I've heard around the Caddo Lake area. I never really repeated it to many people. Actually, it was just between me and my kids. It was a pretty amazing event because, you know, we knew in judging back, it had to be seven or eight foot tall. And let me tell you, it scared the bejeebies out of two young boys. Brothers just saw it for a split second, but I made eye contact with it. And when you make eye contact with something like that, you can actually see intelligence in eyes. Have you ever heard of uh, Bigfoot at that point, or what did you equate at that it to point, when you saw it? At that point, I didn't even know what Bigfoot was when I was eight or nine years old. I didn't learn about, uh, you know, even the thought of there being a Bigfoot till probably I was in my 20s or 30s mm -hmm. and again you know you don't go back and tell people a story like this because they're going to send you to the nut house when you do so we really never related to anybody about that mm -hmm. uh, and actually the very peculiar way that Lyle found out was one of my children uh, uh, my youngest daughter Michelle 
happened to be visiting with Lyle and said, my daddy saw something, and that's what got us together because I never related this in any form or fashion to anybody except my kids and to Lyle once before and today. Cattle Lake's not far from here. Would you mind taking us out there and showing us exactly where it happened? I have no problem doing that. Matter of fact, I would enjoy doing that because Caddo is my home away from home. The location where Faison saw the mysterious creature is known as Devil's Elbow. It's one of the many crooks and curves nestled within Caddo's narrow channels and bogs. To get there, we enlisted the help of our friend Tom Shirley, an outdoorsman who owns property on the banks of Caddo Lake. He had an experience out uh, near Devil's Elbow, so we're hoping you could run us out there. We're going to take a look at where that happened. That's no problem. Yeah, we can go out there. Y'all ready? Yep. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. What you're looking at right now, gentlemen, is nature unchanged for tens of thousands of years. Way. Gentlemen, this is the tree right here. Not much of it left, but there used to be branches that came out where we had the platform for our tree house right here. So as you can see, we were fairly far distance up in the air. We had finished our eating, cleaned up, in the tree house, sleep and I hear a noise. And I look out here, right where our trappings were, where our food was, and we put out there, and there was something bent over there. Couldn't quite make out what it was, scooped it up, and it stood up to immense proportions. Brother was still asleep, so I punched him to wake him up, and he's rather a sound sleeper, so he made noise, and next thing I know, this thing, whatever it was, turned around and was looking straight at us. It stood there for, I don't know, maybe 15, 20, 25 seconds, then all of a sudden turned, went through there, and there's some of the briars left over yeah. there that was there, but it was real thick briars. When it ran through those briars, uh, it was moving fast. Well, the next morning, we get up, come down from the tree house. Right about halfway between uh, here and there uh, we, is where we were at when we first saw the first footprint. Then we saw another one over there by that log, and then there was another one almost entering the uh, briar patch. Then we got to the briar patch and there were kind of like black and brown tufts of hair hmm. on there that were attached to that and it was attached higher than we could reach with our arms. Of course, I'm at the time it was about nine and uh, but it was still much higher than I could reach. We looked at the limb where it was at and it was twice the amount I was tall uh, so this thing had to be seven, eight foot tall. Uh, I've been living on this lake, been down here all my life. We had tree houses built all over this lake, mm -hmm. and that was the only time we ever saw anything like that. But let me tell you, if you ever see something like that, you don't forget it. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing story. And not only did you see something, you found physical evidence, the yep. footprints. Can you describe the shape and size of well, those? The footprints, uh, I'm a brother, put our feet in front of each other to try to measure it and it was still longer than our two feet. Of course, you have to realize I was eight or nine, he was 12 or 13, but the foot was that big and it was probably probably about that wide, okay? So it's human-like, but yeah. just larger proportions. Yeah, gigantic toe on the sun. Would you have tracked it down? Negative, <laughs> negative. I would not have tracked it down. Uh, uh, it really didn't do anything that Right. seemed uh, like it would hurt us. It just seemed like curiosity, and it was sure glad we left it some vittles out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can tell you this mm -hmm. much, I have a good feeling 
that, whatever it was, likes French fries. <laughs> <laughs> well, who doesn't like French fries? <laughs> well, there you go. I was going to ask you, you said, you know, you obviously saw it that night and then you still spent the night in the treehouse. I mean, what, what was going through your mind that night as you're sitting in the treehouse after seeing this thing? Well, after seeing that thing, we were glad we built the treehouse high up in the tree because we were up about 12, 12, 15 feet, feet. And I don't think uh, he could have reached us now. I don't know if he could climb trees or not, or whatever it was, climb trees. But uh, I don't think it could have reached us. And again, uh, we have been sitting up in a treehouse and had a mount, uh, uh, wildcat screaming at us right above our treehouse mm -hmm. and it didn't bother us at boys. Lived in the woods, uh, would stay out there two, three days at a time, uh, and this is at eight, nine, ten years old. So there wasn't much in these woods to scare us, but let's put it this way, we would leave a wide path between us and whatever that was. Not because we think it would hurt us, but I think it wanted to be left alone. The next phase of our investigation was to meet with members of the DuPont family. The DuPonts own a considerable portion of land on the Louisiana side of Caddo Lake. Over the years, members of the family have gotten glimpses of several large hair-covered creatures both on their property and along the open levee which runs behind it. So I know right here in this general area there's been some recent incidents and there's also been things that have gone back long ago. Uh, to establish that something strange may be lurking in, this, in these woods. And I know you've told me several stories uh, about your family and their experiences dating, you know, far back. Can you, you know, reiterate some of those for us? For years, I, I heard stories of, you know, monsters in the woods, but they never called them Sasquatch or Bigfoot or anything like that. They always, they called them wild people. They thought they were just people who lived out in the woods who grew hair on them. They didn't know that, you know, they just thought they were wild people. The first real story I've heard was from my grandfather. He, he seen one when he was 10 years old under a pear tree. Well, three of my great uncles, they started hiking up to, I think this was in the fifties. I want to say the fifties. Uh, they hiked up to around the lake and really bad thunderstorm come and, uh, they didn't bring food, they didn't bring anything, they didn't bring tents, they were just roughing it. You know, they just, you know, you old people, they're just old timers, they knew how to rough it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thunderstorm come along and they seen a big hollow log. And uh, so they all crawled up in the log. And uh, storm passed and they said they kept hearing something at the under, under the log. They said it was about a 60 foot log. And, it was hollowed on one end. You know how the logs do, they'll stay solid and then be hollow on the other. Mm -hmm. And they kept hearing something on the other end. So after the storm passed and they slept in the log all night, they got up the next morning and they said, uh, they had their shotguns. They didn't bring food. They had to kill food to eat to survive. So they thought it was an armadillo, a possum, raccoon. So they go down and they kicked into the log. They said, uh, they called it a wild woman, said a woman. So it was about five and a half foot tall, full of hair, come out of the lock. And uh, stood up, said they could see the breast, said it wasn't very big, mm -hmm. and uh, covered hair, could tell it was a woman. And they said, she come out. He said, they took off one way and she took off the other. <laughs> so that was that was one of the wild, wild people they, they seen. Yeah, I mean, that'd be a startling way to wake up from a camping excursion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be. Uh, have you ever heard any vocalizations or sounds that you couldn't pinpoint and say exactly what it was? Uh, once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it didn't sound like an owl. I was deer hunting on, a, on the edge of a swamp, right on the, edge, uh, on the edge of the lake, right on a hill. I built a blind in there, and I was completely camouflaged. It's about 5.30 in the evening. It get dark about 6. I heard that old boy coming through the water. I said, I'm going to get him, because I thought it was that buck. It stopped about 40 yards from me. I'm on dry land, okay? This thing's in three foot of water, whatever it is. I heard this scream that an animal can't make. It's, it sounded like a trumpet. It sounded like, I don't know what, it sounded, it, 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 you could feel it. 
when I heard it, I knew that wasn't no deer. I ran out of my boots. I had hunting boots on. I ran out of my boots. I ran out of my jacket. And I ran full blast toward that high line because I was on dry land. I was trying to get to the, to the open. It was keeping up with me in three foot of water and breaking down trees and screaming at me all the way to that high line. And once I made it to the high line, I never heard anything again. Never heard any trees break, never heard any scream, but it was keeping up with me all the way. I don't know what that could be. It's gotta be the same thing everybody else is seeing. Nothing makes that sound. Just prior to our visit to Cattle Lake, we learned of a possible footprint found by a local fisherman. He agreed to meet us at the site of the discovery. <laughs> so this is the spot, Sean? It is. It's the where I found the print was actually underwater right now, but I was up on the bridge fishing and um, just kind of looking around and I happened to see something caught my eyes, a, a print of something. And the more I looked at it, I'm like, you know, that looks like a footprint. I'm like, and then of course there's a rock next to it that's probably 16 inches long approximately. And um, it just, like no way, you know, so I had to take a photo of it. And uh, it just, I don't know, it was just, it was real interesting. So, you know, when you saw it, so you, obviously you came down and took a look at it. Uh, can you describe the print? I can. It was um, it was like you know a normal human foot shape, but the uh, the toes were, you know, impressing a little deeper in the mud, and, and just the shape of it was, you know, you could tell it it wasn't a human. And of course, you know, at about 16 inches long, you know, you know, there's there's not going to be a human, especially with just a couple prints right there, barefoot out here by the rocks, um, just with the the signature of the print. Right. Was it coming, did it look like it was going into the water, out of the water? Well, the one was actually facing the, the water, and then the, the secondary print was turned and, and almost overlapping the other one like it was standing and maybe it made a turn to walk off or what have you. Obviously, you spent a lot of time in the woods hunting and fishing, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with all the tracks that, that are out here. So. Exactly. Uh, it's significant for us to find a guy like you that's got that experience and when you see something unusual you can identify it as unusual and uh, you know people say well maybe it was a bear print or something like that uh, but you know you would be a person that could distinguish between right. a bear print and something that was obviously uh, more on the unknown nature. What's really fascinating, of course, is that you have this, these enduring stories that date back decades and you know back to the 1930s or maybe before. And now we're just talked to a guy that found a footprint just months ago in this same exact area. Yeah, I mean, it just like you, you couldn't even put this stuff together if you made it up because everything seems to start lining up. You've got a guy who just walked into the store and told us he had an encounter in the Jeems Bayou area. Yeah. And now we got a guy who's recently found a track and we're just north of Jeems Bayou. Hmm. And that's a place where, you know, I really think uh, a creature could live if it was out here today because it's still very wooded on the north side of Caddo Lake and Jeems Bayou fits right into that area. Hmm. Well, I guess, uh... The logical next step would be to kind of gear up and maybe head down to that spot. What do you think? Yeah, I think that'd be a really good idea. You know, we could get the boat and get out there and just do some paddling around and take a look at the area itself, see what we can see. After hearing the first-hand accounts and considering the possibility of a fresh track, we felt it was time to venture into the brackish waters of Caddo for a more thorough look. Considering both the footprint and the latest sighting by one of the DuPonts occurred in the vicinity of the Jeems Bayou section, it seemed like a prime area for our focus.
During the evening of our exploration, temperatures dropped rather low. There are advantages to low temperatures in a swamp since it eliminates the dangers of snakes and alligators. In our experience, it would not reduce the chances of seeing a Bigfoot-like creature since more than a few sightings in the area had occurred during the winter months. I gather from the witnesses, a lot of them say that it turns and runs and it moves through the branches and the brush really fast. Right. So I mean, whereas we're, we're bogged down trying to cross through here, some that, something that could see better or knew its way around could move much, much faster. So if it heard us coming, smelled us for any distance, it could just get out of here within an instant. Which brings up an excellent point because people always ask, why haven't we found these things? Well, if you can imagine something that's big enough and fast enough and powerful enough to move through these areas, you know, no human is ever going to be able to, to come close to it. Yeah, I think it's an absolute misconception that creatures like Bigfoot are slow and lumbering because they don't understand that there's a lot of accounts of people saying that they move quickly. Mm -hmm. And so when they have to move, they can move. I mean, you know, I think some, in some regards, pop culture uh, or just perhaps the Patterson-Gimlin film, you know, caught strolling, but if the thing needs to move, it can move quick. Based on eyewitness descriptions, Bigfoot is an upright walking biped. In fact, this two-legged gait that features cross-limb coordination with long strides and swinging arms is the primary reason that these creatures appear so human-like. Many witnesses have remarked that these beasts appear as though they are fluidly gliding when they walk, almost as though they are cross-country skiing across the landscape. This may be in part because their heads do not bob up and down when they walk due to their habitual, bent-kneed, horizontal trajectory. Furthermore, these creatures are often described as moving remarkably fast through dense forest or up steep inclines. Their long strides have been measured from around 42 to 72 inches or more, with average stride being about 50 inches and the longest recorded strides topping out at just over 100 inches. Accounts of Bigfoot chasing cars are rare, but some witnesses have claimed that these pursuits occurred at speeds approaching 35 miles per hour. You know, the chances of finding one of these things, actually finding one is probably one in thousands or millions. I mean, you're basically looking for a moving needle in a haystack, right? But the whole point of coming out here is assessing the probability that they exist, looking at the habitat. I mean, we've already done an excellent job of, I think, wrangling eyewitnesses, getting some strong testimony. Um, but that's really what this kind of research is all about. Would you agree? Oh, totally. And that's one of the first things I like to do if I get a report, if I can interview the witness, is go to the place where they said they saw it. There's no better way to assess the possibility than to see it for yourself. And I mean, that's exactly what we're doing here. We've had so many great eyewitness reports, but you have to put those into your own perspective and take a look around. And yeah, are we going to see something while we're out here doing that? Maybe. That would be great. But even if we don't, I think it gives us a sense of the veracity of these stories and the validity of them mm -hmm. uh, for us to take away. Yeah, and also from an ecological perspective, because you have to fit things within the paradigm of, you know, the natural world. Is there enough food out here to sustain a large animal that weighs several hundred pounds? Absolutely. We're, you know, presumably we're talking about a large generalist omnivore, something like a bear. There's bears out here in habitats like this. I mean, if you have a large animal that's willing to eat, I mean, what have we seen? We've seen, I've seen acorns, berries, all kinds of foliage during the summer, you know, fish, shellfish, insects, I mean, mm. birds, small animals, everything. You know, and an animal, a large animal that was, you know, capable of harvesting all of those different food sources and then, you know, sustaining itself out here, there's no reason it couldn't exist. Absolutely. And there's a thousand, a million places to hide. Anything could be standing behind those trees out there. In the water, 
it didn't move, we'd never see it. In some, some ways, you know, you get out here in these dark areas and the places we have, we've heard the stories, you almost expect to see something, you hope you see something. But seeing one of these things is a chance encounter something that doesn't occur every day. It's like people always say, they, you don't find them, they find you. Looking through the vast database of reports, we can find observations of Bigfoot eating pretty much everything, including wild berries, leaves, grasses and roots, nuts, insects, fish, frogs, small animals, deer and elk, and even carrion on occasion. In the Texas bottomlands, there's evidence that Bigfoot eats things like turtles and freshwater oysters in addition to other mollusks. An omnivorous diet makes perfect sense for a huge terrestrial hominid that inhabits the resource-rich forests of the Americas. It's just a spidery network of waterways and it all connects, like lining things up on a map, interconnecting. We do have some footprints. I think it's safe to say that there is some truth to these stories. We just have to keep our eyes open, keep our investigations open, so that we can hopefully find some answers. Next thing I know, this thing, whatever it was, turned around and was looking straight at us. It's not a bear. You know, just changed my reality at that point. It was like, you know, a normal human foot shape. I don't know what that could be. It's got to be the same thing everybody else is seeing. Nothing makes that sound. It's real. Whatever it is that you want to call it, it's real. Reports of a hairy, man-like creature have long circulated in the shadows of the scenic Cattle Lake. As one of the largest flooded forests in the United States, the landscape here is home to a variety of wildlife. Could it also be home to something far more mysterious.